Um, well, thanks for having me here. I'm very excited to be here. And uh, as Sheridan um, said, uh, I'm here to integrate uh, FitChain, which is a platform that I've been developing in the last uh, year and a half, uh, in the Ocean uh, Protocol uh, suite. Uh, so, um, who are FitChain? Or FitChain is basically made by these three guys um, in the last 14 months. Uh, especially Dan and I have been into the corporate world for, for a while uh, to understand uh, how many problems, data problems, these people have. Um, and, uh, and uh, of course, the organization problem that we realized many uh, corporations have is they have a tons of data that they cannot share. Um, and so all this data is basically locked under the desk of someone and there is a lot of bureaucracy that you need to go through in order to unlock this, this data and do some machine learning. On the other side, we also found data scientists, uh, they, they need data. They would like to have as many data as possible. Um, and most of the time they cannot get this data for the same reason. But then we realized there is um, a, a, a universal problem, which is uh, no matter if you are a data scientist or an organization, uh, once you give up your data, uh, that's it. You know, there is no way, no technology except for encryption that, you know, preserves the confidentiality and the secrecy that you, that you need on the data that you share. Um, so what is FitChain? FitChain is um, a marketplace that allows data scientists to uh, operate and uh, do machine learning on data that they cannot, they cannot see. So on data that is meant to stay private. Um, and uh, how did we think about you know, a solution, a possible solutions? There are many solutions that uh, can solve this problem. Some of them are, are, are feasible, some others are really not, at least with current technology. But what we realized is that very simply, data should not leave the organization. <laughs> so it might, it might sound trivial, uh, but actually doing machine learning on data that you cannot see uh, sounds a bit counterintuitive. And if there are data scientists here, for sure I know there are nerds. Uh, uh, now, how many data scientists are here tonight? Don't be shy. And how many nerds are here tonight? <laughs> many more. All right, cool. Well, we are, we are in good company. Uh, so, well, we realized that data should not leave the organization, okay? Um, and of course, at the same time, we want data scientists around the world to solve the problem that that organization has, uh, that data problem that organization has. Um, and of course, we thought about uh, a new way to, for the organization, the so-called data provider, to uh, propose problems. Uh, and so basically, they describe, uh, they provide a description of the data together with a description of the problem they want to be solved so that anyone in the world can actually take this information, the so-called metadata, and uh, eventually write, uh, provide a solution to that, right? Easy, right? So um, the blockchain um, uh, substrate is basically to close the loop on this and incentivize all the actors that will be involved in building this model on private data. So, as a matter of fact, we realized that there are uh, three different customer profiles for FitChain. Uh, and as you can see, these are very highly regulated environments like uh, healthcare providers, researchers, uh, banking services. And we are moving forwards in the, in the healthcare domain, uh, as I will show you in a minute. Um, so, how does it work? Of course, uh, it's late. I don't want you to. Uh, to, to capture all the details of FitChain uh, at this, you know, this late. Uh, so let me give you a very um, uh, nice uh, overview, you know, a colorful one. Usually I use terminals to explain what FitChain is. Uh, I will use one in a minute. Um, and um, so basically what FitChain is, well, it, it starts from the organization. As I said, they have the data and they have a problem, a data science problem, right? Uh, so they um, extract the template of the data. Remember these words, um, extracting the template of the data means it, uh, generating a, a, a metadata that describes the original data and that anybody in the world can use to generate synthetic data that look like the original data, okay? So they throw this stuff into a public ledger, could be IPFS, it could be blockchain. Blockchain might be 
probably too expensive. Let's think about IPFS. Are you guys familiar with IPFS, Interplanetary File System? Uh, it's a decentralized and distributed storage uh, facility, basically. On the other side, there is a data scientist or, or million, a million data scientists. They decide to apply, they can actually search for the problem, the data science problem that, that have been published by, by some organization in the fifth chain network. And they suddenly decide, oh, I would like to work on this diabetes classifier because I have diabetes skills or, or I've been doing that before. And so what they do, they take this template, they uh, generate this synthetic data, and they start writing a solution, neural network, logistic regression, any machine learning model that you might think of. Of course, between the two, there are two components, which is the fit chain pod, um, POD. Um, it's basically the main component that allows an organization and a data scientist to stay in contact on the, on the fit chain marketplace. Uh, Below that, uh, so as soon as the, the um, data scientist you know, provided a solution, they basically ship the solution back to the organization, and the organization will train that machine learning model on behalf of the data scientist. As they do so, they update a, a blockchain ledger about what's going on. Of course, easy to say, but we have, to, we have a lot of guarantees here to, to perform, to, to enforce, for example, we have to guarantee that the code that is submitted by that guy is executed as is. And also we want to make sure that the claims that are performed by the organization about how good or bad the model is are consistent and are true. We, we call this the so-called proof of training. Uh, that is a proof that uh, I'm oversimplifying for, for obvious reasons tonight, but it basically it's a, a set of cryptographic proofs that uh, uh, guarantees that that piece of code that is claiming to be a neural network is actually a neural network and is being trained on data that is, ac that is actually real data. Um, at the end of this training, what happens? That the model is trained um, and can be purchased by anyone in the world. Now you might say, yeah, but people can run away with the model and maybe I can plug in the data in the model and use the model as a viable mean to extract data and actually steal the data from the organization. Yes, you can, but we don't do that because um, the model is encrypted in a special way, uh, which is homomorphic encryption. Uh, we also use another technology that is uh, multi-party computation. So once the model uh, leaves the organization infrastructure, it leaves in encrypted form. And so uh, even the worst case scenario is that the data is secured. The purpose of encrypting the model is that you want anyone in the world to use that model and of course go back to the organization to understand the predictions that that model is generating so that we can monetize the model as well. Um, in addition to that, what the proof of training really does is creating the identity card of the model. We want to know if we ever build a machine learning model that predicts cancer, we want to know who trained that model, on which data, what was the reputation score of the data scientist who wrote the model, what was the reputation score of the data owner, uh, if it was um, a, a high reputation uh, research hospital, and stuff like that. It will be basically a medical device. You don't buy a medical device at the, at the market fair, right? So, um, before going to the demo, because tonight I, I have a demo that actually shows you uh, all, all of these nice words uh, for real, um, uh, just let me go very quickly to, uh, to the fit chain workflow. Of course, I don't expect to cover all the possible uh, details, but basically what we have at fit chain is um, a set of contracts, the so-called registry and registrar. Uh, the registry is basically where we put uh, models, all the actors, uh, model validators, data providers, model providers, the model themselves. For us, the model is, is an entity as uh, you know, equally representable uh, as, uh, as a regular data scientist, for example. In fact, that model, once it's purchased, it, can generate, it will generate revenue, just as a data scientist would do. Um, poor data scientists. <laughs> um, I am one, so it's fine. <laughs> um, well, uh, what else? Another component that we have is, of course, um, 
die, ähm, die, ähm, die light, light, Lighting Chain. It's a, it's a side chain that we use uh, to connect, um, to basically transfer these proofs from the data provider to the, to the model provider without passing through the blockchain. Passing through the blockchain can be extremely expensive, especially if you pass on an Ethereum blockchain, and also extremely slow. So what we want to do is basically a state channel or a parallel chain that maintains, that, that provides the same guarantees of, of, of main chain, that is an Ethereum chain or, or whatever uh, blockchain technology you, you want to use. For us, a blockchain technology, sorry, a blockchain system is um, a component that you can plug in and out uh, as you wish. Um, in addition to this, we also have Boom, Ocean Protocol. So Ocean Protocol is uh, an, an, an interesting uh, marketplace that would allow and will allow um, a fit chain, will allow to validate models in the fit chain ecosystem. Uh, why I'm saying that is because uh, the, one of the best things that Ocean Protocol um, has on the roadmap is data curation. And so I believe that uh, by curating data sets, um, uh, you can, you know, anyone can can basically provide these curated data sets and you and put this curated data set to the disposal of a model validator and validate a model. If you guys are not familiar with model validation in machine learning, it's basically saying something like, okay, if you have a neural network that you claim predicts diabetes with 85% accuracy, given these, this and that medical claims and lab tests, let's see that. So let's challenge the model, okay? And of course you need curated data sets that allow you to do uh, exactly this, to challenge that model and therefore disprove or confirm that claim. Okay, so as you can see the architecture, I, mean, I can go on and on, of course I planned this presentation to be approximately two and a half hours, so please. <laughs> um, uh, are there enough beards there? <laughs> Um, so the architecture of the fit chain pod is, is quite complex, a quite complex piece of software. Um, we have a, a lot of things, for example, an Ethereum wrapper. Uh, we have a, 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 a data e template extractor uh, for uh, tabular uh, CSV files for images. Uh, I'm going to show you something about medical images in very soon. Um, we have uh, uh, wrappers to, to um, uh, cloud storage um, infrastructure like Amazon or Google Cloud. Uh, we have uh, uh, executors, which is where you actually execute the machine learning code that has been submitted by an anonymous and also could also be malicious data scientist. So you want to jail that code in a secure environment because otherwise that code can go around and mess up with your infrastructure. So, you know, we took care of all these things and we basically designed this architecture from scratch. So, uh, I'm going to skip this um, and go straight to, to the most dangerous part of this presentation, which is the real stuff. So, well, does this stuff work? Let's see. I'm, I found this hack. Voila. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, is not doing that? I think it's doing that, no? No. So it's the first time that I try this during screen recording. I usually... Okay. So to use the... Can you guys hear me? I guess so. So to use the feed chain... Um, um, so what I'm going to show you now is um, an organization that has some private data, uh, for example, images, um, and uh, another data scientist, data scientist who decides to um, submit, apply to that project and basically submit a solution to that image classifier. It's an image classifier that basically detects uh, cats and dogs. Okay? So the first thing that you want to do is running an APFS daemon. APFS is this uh, decentralized file storage um, but of course you can run any other thing, for example a big chain DB or any other decentralized storage. The second thing is a blockchain. So usually you are on Geth and you synchronize with the Ethereum blockchain. In this case I'm going to run a local blockchain 
local with respect to this laptop. Uh, and these are some accounts that are on this uh, you know, fake chain. But this is the equivalent of Ethereum. And of course, there are the contracts, the registry, and uh, the registrar that I showed you before. So we just, we just migrate these contracts on this synthetic blockchain. OK? So OK, it's, it's creating these transactions. And, uh, and now we have these contracts placed on this, on this chain. Uh, the addresses are here and here. How could you not see that? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, the fig chain pod is this magic component that allows a, an organization and, and the data scientist, actually, in fact, any actor, to be on the fig chain network and behave as anyone, as a data provider, a model provider, model validator, whatever. So the first thing that we have to do, of course, is configuring the, the, um, the pod and saying the contracts are at this address. Okay? So these two addresses we have to change because I just did it. So the VPC is the registrar, and the registry is this one. So I like to change names because otherwise it's too easy. Um, so OK, now it's saved. and. Uh, now we can run the pod. This is the pod. So this is an API that started locally. And uh, we can use any client uh, to interact with the pod. And the pod will basically interact with the rest of the world via the blockchain. Does it make sense? Still here? Cool. Now, the first thing that we have to do, of course, is log in to the pod. So I created this amazing thing, which is well, I need to take an account. I am this guy today. And I use this. And I just log in to the pod. OK. So I logged in. Now the pod is synchronizing, is syncing with the, 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 um, the blockchain. OK? We are at block zero, F for your information. <laughs> Um, OK, so we can start the uh, user interface. Oh, I didn't tell you, we have a user interface. A dashboard. Takes a while to load. Takes quite long to load. If you guys have personal stories in the meantime. <laughs> OK, so this is the, uh, the, the, the user interface. So as you can see here, I can impersonate a, an organization, a data provider. So I have data. So the first thing I want to do is, of course, you know, create a provider. Now, provider is, in my case, is going to be, uh, I usually put data under users, frag, documents, data. OK, that's my, my director. But of course, if I have an S3 bucket on Amazon, I can, I can do that. So let, let me create a provider, which we call, I don't know, my secret data. I don't know, name the same, the type. It can be an Amazon, uh, but tonight I'm going to use a, a local file system. And as I said, uh, I'm under users, frag, documents, data. OK. And then I want to create, as again, as a data provider, I want to add a data source. And so the data sources that I want to add is, for example, this directory. Uh, usually I put all my data here. Uh, we can put this cats and dogs directory. So let me add that. So create a data source, cats and dogs, name, I don't know, the same, description. Some images of cats and dogs. The format, the UI is not yet um, is not up, up, updated, so but it will automatically detect it's not a CSV file, so don't worry. Uh, the provider is my secret data that I just created, and the path where the data I want to add is um, is uh, cats and dogs relative to to users frag user documents data. OK. Now, if I click, oh, I cannot click. Wow. 
Oh, this is bad. <laughs> Ouch. How can I click? Oh, you guys are smart. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm creating. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks. So, I'll give you some tokens when we launch an ICO. <laughs> Remind me of that. So, as you can see, I, I started a task. Now, what is this task doing behind the scenes is something that we cannot know. <laughs> but actually, I have prepared something for you uh, because uh, I want to show you exactly what is happening behind the scenes on, a, on another data set, you know, because it's, it's, taking a while. it's taking a while. So I created this super secret data just to show you what is it doing. So this, this stuff, as you can see, we have a brain cancer cause. Um, we have uh, a little pumpkin. Uh, uh, we have a secret frag when I had mustache. Uh, we have some tables like CSV files, as you can see, um, and some real medical images um, about skin cancer. So, okay, let's see what happens when I want to extract the template of this private data. Okay, so I launch this. Now, I'm, I'm doing exactly what the pod is doing while I'm, as I'm speaking. So it's extracting this template and creating this secret JSON, which is the data template that will be used by someone else to create the synthetic data. So if I open this stuff, it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, let's, let's prettify that. Okay. So it's going to be a collection of files. And as you can see, there is, a, know, it's an image, a JPEG, it's a, there is a Merkle root, there is a base name, etc. Okay. And it's super long. Okay. Now don't save this. Now, if we want to create synthetic data out of that template, that, that's the template that goes on chain or public. So if I create a, um, a secret, um, let's say, I want to create a synthetic uh, uh, data from this template, um, I can just do this. Okay. So it is creating something. Let's see what is that. So secret frag is going to be this guy. And uh, table is going to be this guy. So as you can see, it has been randomized everything, but still maintaining the structure of the data. Otherwise, data scientists cannot write any model. Uh, and of course, medical images with probably the face of, of, of patients will be just kitties. All right, so let's go back to the pod. And indeed, the task is finished. So now data sources should be there, cats and dogs, with a description, and that's been materialized. Materialized means I created a template. So now, as a data provider, I can just finish here. I can say, OK, I want to rent my data together with a description. Anybody else can, via the FitChain network, just rent my data to train models. But I want to go farther. I want to create a project. and so. Let's create a project. So the project is, let's say, the cats and dogs. I want to be creative tonight. Cats and dogs project. And the data source is the one that, the only one that I have. Um, and uh, as a description, uh, I usually get, an, I get a clap for that, but OK. <laughs> Input, output, I don't know, some labels, input some images of cats and dogs, okay, etc. So I can provide a description together with my project and the data source that I intend to attach to this project. So I create that. Oh, wait a minute. Nobody will ever solve that problem because I need a reward. <laughs> Let's give them a thousand bucks. So, name. sorry. Name. Oh, and the name. Wow. Let's copy that. Okay. Thanks. Too many tokens tonight. <laughs> uh, so let's create this project as a data provider. 
Uh, now, this is a project cannot be modified once created. This will go on chain. Okay, so the data that describes this project will go on chain. And why do why cannot we change this? Is because you know you don't want a, a, a compute provider or a data provider to change the reward after the problem has been solved, right? Um, or change the conditions or change the description, and so you cannot dispute that. So this goes on chain, and you cannot you cannot change that ever. So let's go ahead. Okay, project created. Now. Uh, now we have to impersonate the the data scientist, right? Now usually the data scientists I know uh, use terminals, um, so let me impersonate the data scientist and let me put this amazing stuff here. <laughs> Otherwise, you guys get confused. <laughs> So let me be a data scientist and, uh, and see which uh, projects are running on the blockchain. Feed chain projects. This is a command line interface connect that is connected to the pod, but it's actually um, taking the data directly from the, uh, from the blockchain. So this is the project ID. Of course, if I want a description, feed chain project, uh, project ID. This is the cats and dog project. There is a reward at 1,000 and the description of the data associated to that project, right? So I say, OK, I want to work on that. I mean, who doesn't want 1,000 bucks for nothing? So um, let's create a workspace. Um, let's call it the cat's workspace. Uh, okay, so fit chain uh, init workspace, give it a name, cat's workspace, and the project ID. Huh. Sorry, workspace init. Why did you guys t t did you tell me? Okay, now what is happening here? Okay, this is awkward now, you got a point. Um, <laughs> so what happens now is that uh, the pod has actually created a, um, some boilerplate code that allows a data scientist who doesn't know how to load this data from the collection, from that JSON. And so it created automatically some code.py and even a, a Python notebook. If, if data scientists want to use a Python notebook, for example, Jupyter notebook. How many of you are familiar with Jupyter notebooks? Okay, so you could use that as well. Uh, now, for the sake of this, not to make it too long, uh, I already created some code, I wrote some code, so let me just copy some that I have um, here. Uh, code, and I copy it here. Okay, so what this code does is basically something very simple. It's just this. It calls the fit chain runtime and, and gives the fit chain runtime the data, the data source ID so that it can load it for you. And from here on, from line 10 on, is the regular code that any data scientist would write to solve that problem, which is a bit of data preparation, which is uh, uh, setting the dimensions of your images, um, um, uh, creating a neural network, uh, which is here. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Keras, we are using Keras here. Um, it's a relatively big neural network. Um, and then the other thing, this is the boilerplate code. Data scientist doesn't have to write this. The boilerplate code is written for you. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's how to complete it for you. So what you do, you basically create this model and that's it. You just plug in that, mo plug that model into the runtime system so that the runtime will train it for you into a remote, to a remote location, which is the data provider. See, your faces are weird. <laughs> okay, so we are done with this. Um, let's, let's save and run. Feed chain, um, workspace, save code, feed chain, workspace run. Now if I do run, 
a job is created. The code has been delivered to the data provider. And we only have, as a data scientist, we only have this job ID, which we can just follow in the logs. Okay, this is what is happening in a remote location at the data provider. We cannot see anything else. So of course, we are on the same laptop. We can actually see other things. And here I have, I want to print some jobs for you. So we have a job, the same job that we created from the data scientist. So let's see what, what's happening. Um, log out. Boom. A network is training. Come on, guys, clap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so now um, we have to train this model. Uh, as I said, two and a half hours. <laughs> uh, no, I just, uh, it's going to be one epoch. Um, uh, of course, one epoch is not enough to, to train. This model is basically rubbish because you know, it's going to have like an accuracy of 50%, like flipping a coin. Um, you need to train a model, a, a neural network on images of that, of, of that amount of images way longer than one epoch. Um, so, but just for the sake of, exp of explanation, let's just run one epoch. Now, what we can do as a data, this is something, you know, this is a hack for, for, to, for me to show you uh, what's going on behind the scenes. But actually, what data scientists see is it's only, uh, it's only this, okay? So it says, uh, okay, I fetched data source, I generated, uh, I generated source code, uh, the data source has been fetched, the source code has been generated. Now, the only thing that we can, uh, there you go, it's, it's doing other things, like it's loading the Keras model, the model has been loaded, um, it's training. Now, this is the pod of the organization running in, uh, 30 seconds, we are really done. Um, and then we can print the metrics, which is accuracy, loss, which is exactly what the data scientists want to see. Uh, in the meantime, uh, all these transactions are being created to the blockchain. So to this guy here. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see. I think that we are done, almost. Uh, it's uh, val validating the model. And now we can print the matrix of this job. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. So, well, um, this was it. Um, actually, this was not it. <laughs> we just started. Um, because we are basically delivering this technology um, for a pilot, which is a real stuff. So remember the cats and dogs is, is a funny example, of course, for uh, to have a, a good time. But I think that the, the best is when you can train, when you can unlock the power of data that are otherwise uh, locked somewhere. And when these data is, for example, skin cancer images, um, 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 diabetes, medical records, uh, you know, all things that uh, research institutions are really um, uh, praying for. Uh, to, 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 to do research, for example. And so we are partnering with the Sun Doctors Skin Cancer Clinics, is a, um, a clinic uh, for, uh, from Australia, and they are providing the data, we are providing the technology, and they want to use exactly the fit chain concept um, as a test, as a pilot, and then eventually scale it to their 30 clinics across Australia. Um, so uh, that's it. Uh, I would go straight to the end because I know that you guys are tired and uh, this is us. We are, of course, uh, continuing the development of FitChain uh, into the um, uh, Ocean Protocol uh, data marketplace. 
in order to uh, provide the, all the plumbing and uh, also guarantee the same level of securities to data scientists who don't have to know the nitty gritty of blockchain and all that stuff. We can take care of that. And uh, of course, they can just deploy their models back and forth and, uh, and yeah, have this great technology at their fingertip. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, sure. I am, as a scientist, just assuming, without seeing the data, how can I adjust the parameters? Yeah, that's a that's a nice question. So, as a data scientist who cannot uh, have access to the data, of course, you have limitations. So, for example, uh, data exploratory analysis um, is not possible. Um, what we do with FitChain when we generate the template, we provide the statistical um, metrics of uh, of the. Uh, numeric data that are at the organization, at the data provider. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, the data provider still has, um, you know, still can choose if they want to release that information or not. Now, your question was, how can I tune parameters during training? Now, during training, in fact, once you deploy your model to the remote location, now you see that in the in the um, in the terminal, but actually you have access to the same uh, information via the dashboard. So you can basically uh, pause, resume your model, stop it, um, make a correction to your code, redeploy the code. So you can act, you can actually do the same that you are used to do on your personal machine. Uh, of course, there will be a latency uh, in the in the process because there is a, a network and the blockchain in between, but it's still possible. Hi, uh, how does the, the reward model work? Because so far we've seen how we protect the data owner, but um, I've seen no um, the thing that actually protects the data scientists from the data owner linking their model or uh, how the, the, the reward is released once you know, certain criteria are met. Is that like an automatism that mm -hmm. once we reach like an accuracy level of 95% that you know, the is released right. and yeah, exactly. So that's a condition. Uh, uh, the data provider or whoever um, uh, creates the project uh, it can also provide a condition uh, to release the money locked in an escrow account. And that would naturally be always one hundred percent. Yeah, then they will never have the model. Uh, oh, all oh, right. So they, they'll only have the model, you know, once. Well, in fact, no. In fact, the they have the model since the. It depends if the data provider is also the compute provider, so they are basically running the computation. Yeah, the, you can separate everything here. So the three actors, data provider, model provider, and compute provider can be three different um, actors, three different people, but also can be two people. That is the data scientist for model provider and data provider uh, and compute provider can be the same person, all right? So you can have that, that use case. Now, if you um, set, a, an ac uh, set a condition on, I want a model that is 100% accurate. Okay, it, you are very strict on the condition. Uh, data scientists will see that and they will decide to apply or not. Because that condition is basically uh, in the metadata of the project that you cannot change once you submit. Yeah. Yeah, there. Okay, so it's, it's slightly related. It's slightly related to the parameters question, but if you allow people to make multiple submissions, what's to stop people playing with parameters, making multiple submissions, and just overfitting until they get the accuracy that they want? They cannot overfit, in fact, because they don't control the data. You yeah. can't. You can play with lots of different parameter variations and get higher fit, and you know you'll, you'll overfit sooner or later if you allow yeah. people to infer lots of. Yeah, sure. That's called grid. You can use any, any grid search um, uh, approach does exactly that, exploring the parameter space. That's what data scientists do for, for a living. Now, if they do that, they are spending a lot of time and a lot of effort in providing a solution, and I think they should be rewarded. They're not overfitting the model. Overfitting means they are training the model over and over on, on the same data set, and they keep validating the model on the same data set. Time for one more question. There. Okay. So the example you gave is of a classification model. Uh, my question is twofold. One is 
who gets to define the metric and second uh, you can have models where the metric is not straightforward for example if you have unbalanced classes you can get a great score if it is predicting the majority class so does the data provider really define the metric or uh, does the the model submitter really have a hand in that yeah yeah, it's a good question. So data provider can provide the uh, metrics if they can, of course. Uh, if they cannot, because we, you know, they're not supposed to know because they are data providers and they don't know anything about data science, for instance. Now, still, by providing the data template, uh, the data scientist, who's supposed to be a data expert, knows if the data is unbalanced because he has the statistical properties of the data. He doesn't have the raw data, but he has the statistical property of, uh, properties of the data. And so he can decide to use a fancier uh, algorithm to deal with the unbalan uh, unbalanced classes or even not submit any, uh, not, even not apply to, to, to that project because he considered the data source not to be complete for that specific problem. Uh, I believe at, at, that, at this point of development, we haven't defined who, um, who defined the metrics except for the data provider, uh, who defines the type of metric. So if he wants an error loss, if he wants to optimize towards an error loss, or if he wants to optimize towards accuracy or any other, or an F1 score or whatever. Um, and also the value of that statistical property, it's at this point in time, as I speak, is only the data provider that can do that. So it is possible for data scientists to game the system by choosing a metric which gives a notionally high score. If they can choose the metric, yes, but at this, at this point in time they cannot. Only the data provider, uh, that is the organization who has the data and the problem, can define the metric. Okay, Francesco. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks.